Hey guys, welcome to my channel, Crime Rewind. My name is Jen Marie, and today we'll be discussing the case of the unsolved murder of eight-year-old Joshua Randall Harmon. And we're gonna go ahead and uh, jump right into this because this case isn't um, going to be uh, pleasurable for me to discuss. The researching it um, was pretty difficult and uh, emotional. So we're gonna go, go ahead and get right into it. Um, Joshua Randall Harmon. He lived in Roswell, Georgia with his mother, Cherie Laws, and his stepfather, Douglas Laws. And he was actually uh, killed on May 15th, 1988, uh, which was Mother's Day weekend, um, that weekend. He um, disappeared from his um, apartment complex, from his Roswell, Georgia apartment complex, uh, Sunday night, uh, the night of the 15th. He was reported missing around 7.30 p.m. by his mother, uh, Sheree Laws. Sheree says that Joshua had been <clears throat> running in and out of the apartment uh, all day. If you know anything about the 80s or, you know, 90s, whatnot, um, that was a common thing back then, uh, letting your kids run, run around outside all day long. Not too much supervision. I mean, just uh, a lot more trust uh, as far as that goes back then. So, um, he had been running in and out of the apartment all day long. <clears throat> One of his trips um, into the apartment was to bring his mother three big, really big, beautiful um, yellow roses. And um, when she asked him where he had gotten these roses, he told her that a man who lived in the next building at the apartment complex gave them to him. He, uh, after that, he left and then a short time later came back uh, to get his two... Um, Tiger's Eye Rocks, which I'm going to put up a picture of a Tiger's, um, tiger's Eye Rock, what it looks like. <clears throat> uh, he left again and returned moments later. Uh, he was super excited, super happy. Uh, Joshua said that uh, he had went to show his Tiger's Eye Rocks to the man who lived, the same man who lived next door, or next in the next building over, uh, showed the man his Tiger Rocks, and that the man had said he also had a Tiger Rock that um, was so big that it was worth a hundred million dollars. Now, we all know that, uh, well, sometimes, when you talk to a small child or a younger child, you might exaggerate uh, things a little bit just to, um, you know, um, to, to make them happy or whatever. I do that sometimes with my kids. Um, you know, so that's uh, the fact that this man told him that uh, really isn't that odd. Um, in case you're wondering, uh, obviously it's not worth a hundred million dollars, but sometimes, you know, you exaggerate, uh, solely for a kid's entertainment. <clears throat> then after, uh, after he came, came home, he went home and told his mother that, uh, he left again. He left the apartment again around 4 30 PM. And this was actually the last time that his mother, um, saw him alive. So, um, when he left, Joshua had told his mother that he was going to see if his friend Timmy, <clears throat> his best friend Timmy, who lived actually in the same complex, uh, if he could come outside to play. Uh, when he went over to Timmy's house and knocked on the door, uh, Timmy's father came to the door and told Joshua that Timmy couldn't actually come out and play because they were about to sit down um, to eat dinner. So um, Joshua told him that he would actually uh, go wait in the fort, uh, which was uh, obviously a, a, a made, a, a man-made um structure out in these um, woods out behind the apartment complex that the kids had built, I guess, and um, was Joshua's favorite place to hang out and go play in the woods because he loved nature. <clears throat> so he told uh, Timmy's father that he would be out in the fort in the woods waiting for Timmy to go out and play if uh, he wanted to come out and play after he got done eating his dinner. Um, that actually was the last sighting of Joshua from anyone um, alive. So <clears throat> around 6 p.m. that night, Cherie had uh, started preparing dinner, and she actually asked, uh, asked her husband, uh, Douglas, who was Joshua's stepfather, and her, her father, who was visiting, um, visiting them from Illinois, uh, Roy Carlisle is his name. She asked Douglas and Roy to go uh, actually go find Joshua, tell him that uh, dinner would be ready soon. <clears throat> uh, a short while later, they returned 
uh, back home and asked Sheree if um, Joshua had, had come back and she said no, he had not come back. Um, Douglas and Roy told Sheree that they had checked, they had went out to the woods, they had checked the fort, uh, but he wasn't there. They had also checked, uh, went by Timmy's um, place and, um, you know, he wasn't there either. So, um, while they were there, you know, Timmy had told them, told them that the last encounter he had to have with Joshua and that uh, he actually was never able to make it out to the fort you know, uh, to go meet him, to go play, uh, after dinner. And, um, he hadn't seen him since he had left his house, you know. So, uh, unfortunately, um, Timmy never made it back out to the fort and, uh, and he hadn't actually seen him since he had left his house, uh, that afternoon. Um, after that, some of the neighbors, uh, in the apartment complex joined Douglas and Roy in looking for Joshua, but they were unable to locate him. So by then, it was beginning to actually get dark outside. So um, around 7.30, 8 o'clock p.m., a panicked Cherie called uh, 911 at that time. Uh, after she called 911, the Roswell uh, Police Department, uh, the Fire Department, and Search and Rescue uh, all quickly showed up and started uh, searching for the boy. So initially, and this is from newspaper, uh, newspaper articles that I read, Initially, the police uh, came out and said that they were positive that uh, Joshua was runaway. That's what they initially said. And um, they classified him as a runaway and theorized that maybe he had uh, gotten lost and disoriented in the woods and had decided to uh, make his way back to the family's old apartment, which was only located uh, one mile away from their um new apartment complex. They'd only been living in this apartment complex uh, for just three weeks. They'd only been there three weeks and their old apartment complex was only less than a mile away. It wasn't far away at all. So that's what they theorized is that he had um, he had gotten lost and apparently tried to walk back to this old apartment complex and that he was a runaway. You know, so they were, uh, the police basically said that, that he didn't get abducted. There was no way. So, um, the apartment complex, uh, where he was killed and where he lived, uh, then it was called the Round Tree Apartments. Now, uh, both apartment complexes are still there, uh, but both of them have been renamed. The apartment where he was killed, the apartment complex where he was killed was called Round Tree Apartments, uh, back then. Now it's called River Crossing at Roswell. Then their old apartment complex, which was the one that was a mile away, Back then it was called Hol Holcomb Crossing Apartments. Now it's called the Crossings at Holcomb Bridge. Just thought I would uh, put that in there. Uh, the, new, uh, the new names of these apartment complexes for anybody who might happen to live there. <laughs> so you know. Um, so they searched for, they searched for Joshua uh, that night, didn't find anything. Uh, the search continued on through the next day, which was Monday, um, with nothing being found. So um, they continued on through Tuesday. On Tuesday, divers, they actually brought in divers to uh, search the lake. There was a lake, uh, actually a pretty decent sized lake, uh, located behind this apartment complex. Uh, they brought in divers, the divers searched the lake, they didn't find anything. Um, so uh, also that Tuesday, around 1 p.m. that Tuesday, the family actually received a phone call at, um, you know, on their house phone, a uh, phone call with all, uh, with someone saying on the other line, all they said was, I've got your kid. And then they uh, hung up. This was this phone call was actually later um, discovered to have been a hoax. So that wasn't, that wasn't a major, um, I'm sure it was traumatizing at the time, but uh, you know, it was later discovered to be a, to be a hoax. <clears throat> uh, not long after that, actually, after that phone call, uh, a Lieutenant Donald Moss with the Roswell Police Department actually discovered uh, Joshua's body uh, hidden under pine straw in a dense part of the brush and he was actually discovered um, it was only a couple hundred yards away from the apartment complex so it wasn't was not far away from from the actual uh, apartment where he lived so he stumbled upon his body like by chance I guess I don't know because they had been searching this whole area um, for a couple days and they hadn't seen him or found him. So, uh, I don't know how this police officer stumbled, 
suddenly stumbled upon his body, but he did, supposedly. Um, he said it was hidden, hidden under pine straw. Um, there had also been an attempt to conceal uh, Joshua's body with um, pine straw, there was loose dirt, there was also logs placed on top of him. Uh, some, rep some police reports say that Joshua was shirtless, um, but Sher Cherie says that she was told uh, that he was discovered uh, with no clothes on. The only thing he was wearing was um, both of his socks and only one shoe. Um, none of his other clothing apparently was ever found, according to Cherie. Um, police re the actual police reports uh, say other things, but according to Cherie, this is what the police department told her. Uh, she says that when he went missing, what he was wearing that day was a white uh, t-shirt and cut off jean shorts, along with socks and um, tennis shoes. So apparently his shorts were gone, his underwear, his shirt, and the only thing he was left wearing was two socks and one shoe. So, um, and it's messed up the way that um, Sheree found out that her son was actually found. Um, it wasn't through the police wasn't through anything like that. Uh, she found out from a phone call from the grandmother of Timmy, uh, Joshua's best friend who lived in the complex. Um, Timmy's grandmother actually called Cherie to let her know that she had seen on the news that uh, the police had actually found uh, Joshua's body. So <clears throat> it was all over the news. It was all over the news and the police uh, didn't even tell, they didn't even tell the family that uh, his body was found. So um, that's how Cherie found out that her son had been found dead. So, and actually at the uh, news of her son being found dead, uh, Cherie collapsed uh, with grief. And then after that had to be sedated and, and then hospitalized. I think she was hospitalized for uh, two day, at least two or three days. Uh, she was hospitalized because she um, was so, she just couldn't, she couldn't handle it. That was a, Joshua is, was her only child, her only child. So uh, she just couldn't, she couldn't take it, and uh, she had to be hospitalized. She was in there for at least two days that I know of. Uh, actually, uh, and also Joshua's biological father, his name was Larry Harmon. Um, he had been participating in the search and rescue um, efforts the whole time, and when Joshua's body was discovered, he actually uh, collapsed and fell to his knees, sobbing uncontrollably. So, um, you know... It's, I can just imagine in my head, like, the scene that must have been going on. It's just, it's horrible to think about. Um, <clears throat> Sharia is quoted as saying, uh, quote, I will keep, I keep hoping it will all turn out to have been a mistake, that the body they found wasn't really his, and I'll wake up one morning and find him back at home. I know that's not going to happen, but I can't help wishing. <sighs> so... You know, reports on his manner of death initially said that he had been strangled, but after the medical examiner performed an autopsy, he was found to have been uh, actually beaten in the head and asphyxiated. Now, um, beaten in the head with what? Um, I've never been able to find out uh, what he was hit with. Uh, rocks? A log? I mean, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. It's, I was never, I've never read the answer to that anywhere, so... I don't know, I don't know what that is. And also, uh, asphyxiated, if, in case y'all don't know the difference. Uh, strangulation. Strangulation is, um, the ending result is basically the same. I mean, a lack of oxygen, a cut, a cut off, uh, your air supply is cut off, so you um, eventually die. Strangulation, though, is uh, basically where you, there's, there's ligature strangulation, there's manual strangulation. Basically, it's uh, something that's wrapped around your neck or pressed on your neck, I guess, that um, compresses your uh, carotid artery, your blood flow, basically the blood flow to your brain, which deprives your brain um, of oxygen. And um, so that's strangulation. Now, asphyxiation is actually uh, slightly different to where it's basically a compression of your trachea, and um, so it uh, obstructs your your intake of oxygen. So that's, that's there's slight differences. Um, 
So initially it was thought that he was uh, strangled, and then the ME changed, um, changed it to asphyxiation. Now, which means he was smothered, like something was placed maybe over, um, over his face. You know, smothering is a form of asphyxiation, or uh, maybe chest compression, or, um, you know, if someone uh, a lot heavier than Joshua was perhaps uh, kneeling on his chest and on his throat with maybe their knee or their arm, I mean, who knows, but, uh, you know, it could happen that way. So, um, but I've never been able to find out um, any specific details about um, the exact method of um, asphyxiation. So uh, I don't know. I don't even know if Cherie knows, knew that. I don't. I don't think she did. I don't think they ever. They didn't tell her anything. So I was never actually able to find out anything myself. So <clears throat> now, when the police uh, had said they thought Joshua had run away, uh, Cherie insisted he would uh, never do that. Never. Joshua, who had a learning disability, um, and Uncle actually uh, verified confirmed that he was dyslexic, which is a learning disability, you know, I don't think, but it wasn't severe. Uh, he sel seldom wandered far from his family's apartment, according to other uh, family members. Cherie said, and I quote, he was easily frightened and intimidated. Uh, his stepfather said, I quote, we are the ones that know him best, and we know Joshua did not run away. Joshua was too frightened of everything, too dependent on his mother to be away from her for long. He would not leave in a stressful situation. And I actually can attest to this fact because I also have um, a son who is dyslexic. And I have to agree with that. I mean, um, I don't, you know, he's my son, he's very, um, not, he's not clingy or dependent or too much, but, but it's just, he's so, he's just the sweetest to boy, you know, and he, um, he just, I, I, I agree, I would never, he would never do, you know, he would never stray too far or be away, I mean, he is dependent on, on me, and he's, you know, he's, he's a mama's boy, so, you know, he would never, he would be the same way, he would never stray too far, he just wouldn't, there's no, I can't, he would never run away, never in a million years, so I can kind of, um, attest that, but he's so intelligent, he's, you know, like, and the same thing with Joshua, apparently, is it's super intelligent. Just because there's, when they say learning disability, it doesn't mean they're stupid or that they're um, ignorant. It's, it's <clears throat> I mean, my son is extremely intelligent, and um, apparently Joshua was too. So being dyslexic, that doesn't have anything to do with your intelligence level. Okay, so just to get that out there. <clears throat> um, Douglas, uh, Joshua's stepfather, goes on to describe Joshua as being a nature nut who loved the lake that is behind the apartment complex. And I quote, he loved it here, finding animals, ducks, and new friends. He had no desire to leave. Uh, Joshua was actually uh, laid to rest um, that Friday, May 20th, at Green Lawn Cemetery in Roswell, <clears throat> and uh, which uh, there's footage of actually where we visited. Um, his grave at Green Lawn Cemetery. After the funeral service, Joshua was laid to rest uh, Friday, May 20th, at Green Lawn Cemetery in Roswell. At his funeral, his mother uh, read this. Joshua touched everyone he knew in a very magical way. He had an unconditional love and trust in all things. His love for God and nature was very unusual for a child his age, as was his understanding of both. His smile and words would light up an entire room. He hurt when others hurt and somehow always knew how to make people smile, even at the worst of times. Joshua didn't understand a lot of the world around him, but found an unusual comfort and peace in God and nature. He communicated with all animals in a way no one understood. There are no words <clears throat> which can express the joy he brought to everyone's lives. He was truly a very special angel God sent down to us and to everyone. He gave a very special gift of love, faith, hope, and happiness. I always called him the light of my life. He was that and so much more to everyone. Joshua had some very rough times in his life, but somehow always saw the good in things. He had his father's disposition, kind, generous, loving to all, and forgiving of everything. 
there's no way to express the loss felt by all, as he touched us in such a very special way. He changed our lives just by being the wonderful, very loving child that he was. I love you, Joshua, more than life. We all do. That will never die. You will remain in all of our hearts forever. I can no longer hold you in my arms. You are in God's arms now, and you will never again suffer. You will never have to feel any more of life's unfair pain. You are at peace, my baby. <clears throat> Later on, uh, she created, uh, Sheree created a virtual memorial online. I think it was 2007 she created this. And in this, um, she describes in this virtual memorial, uh, she describes uh, dreams that uh, apparently her son had been having prior to, um, to his, his death. And uh, one dream, Joshua said that uh, three angels, three angels had come to him and told him not to be afraid. Um, and then a short time after that, he had another dream. Uh, he came down uh, to breakfast one morning and he said, uh, quote, I'm going to be with God soon. Sheree responded by uh, telling him that uh, one day you will be with God, but not for a very long, long time. And then because out of curiosity, she asked him why he would say such a thing. Joshua told her that um, the night before, uh, at you know, the night before, and he insisted that these weren't dreams, that, the, that this is, uh, was actually real. Um, he said that God and his great-grandfather had come to him and told him not to be afraid, that they would be there to take care of him. And Cherie says that Joshua was not upset at all by this, but seemed to actually be um, comforted by it, which is so odd to me. It's just so weird. I mean, that it actually it's, it gives me chills. I mean, because it's just... If all that is true, that's, that's really, um, I don't know, profound, I guess. Um, as far as sus suspects uh, in his murder go, um, the police focused primarily, primarily on Cherie Douglas and Roy, Cherie's father, as being the primary suspects for years, for years, okay? Um, they really focused on Douglas, the stepfather. <clears throat> Apparently almost two years after Joshua's murder, uh, the GBI, which the GBI did get involved, the GBI asked the family to take lie detector tests. They say, um, the family says they asked themselves, they asked the GBI, please give us polygraph uh, tests after, the, after you know, um, Joshua was murdered, but the police refused to give them uh, these lie detector tests. So when they were finally given, two years later, uh, Sheree and Douglas say they passed, um, but the GBI won't even acknowledge that uh, these tests were administered. So I don't know what I don't know what's going on there. They won't even acknowledge that the tests were given. Uh, Shri and Douglas said that they passed. I don't know about Roy. It never mentioned whether he or if he even took it because um, he, like I said, he's from Illinois. So uh, he probably went back to Illinois. He probably didn't even take the polygraph test. But Shri and Douglas, they say they passed the GBI. Won't even acknowledge that at all. <clears throat> they did have another possible suspect, um, like. A day or two, like after um, Joshua was murdered, they came out and said that another suspect uh, was a fugitive named um, Norman Norman Lewis Glenn, who had escaped from the Fulton County Correctional Institution in Alpharetta, which is only eight miles away from Joshua's apartment. Uh, Glenn was actually in prison, serving a six-year uh, prison sentence for child molestation, and he had escaped from uh, that jail. Uh, six hours before Joshua disappeared. So uh, that's apparently why, you know, just because of his charge and what he did and um, uh, the fact that he had uh, just escaped. Uh, a few months later, however, <clears throat> the police announced that Norman Glenn was no longer a suspect and they didn't ever uh, explain why this was. So still don't know. Still don't know why they uh, rolled him out. I mean, or if they ever caught him. I mean, I, I wasn't able to find anything on this dude about whether he was uh, apprehended or not. Um, so I was able to find also online uh, a Reddit thread uh, about uh, Joshua Harmon. <clears throat> now, after reading through all these, um, all the comments and all the all the people just chiming in on this Reddit thread, um, I came across actually. Uh, Entries that sh was from Sherry herself, uh, Sheree, um, on this Reddit thread about her son. So um, 
after reading this, she made, she said some pretty interesting things. <clears throat> she severely criticizes the GBI on the handling of Joshua's case. According to her, the GBI agent in charge uh, solely focused on Joshua's stepfather as the primary suspect. And the female GBI agent uh, apparently had never, this was her first case, uh, she apparently had never uh, investigated a murder before, ever. And Cherie said that she had a major attitude towards the entire family, had a major attitude, wasn't helpful, was actually really quite rude. Um, I mean, she just did, she just talks about her and how she was just seriously unprofessional and uh, was not um, cooperating with the family as far as, uh, you know, sympathy or just, just cooperation uh, with them, which I can't even imagine when you're grieving after your son was just murdered, knowing that you're innocent and that you didn't do anything and being treated like that by law enforcement uh, <laughs> has to be a pretty horrible experience, obviously. Um, this agent, this female agent, was apparently so sure that it was a stepfather, that the clothing evidence that I mentioned earlier, the two socks and the one shoe, were destroyed and not kept. So, this is ridiculous to me. They were so sure. They're so sure that the stepfather was, was uh, Douglas, was the culprit, that uh, they just got rid of the evidence because they didn't need it, right? So, Cherie says that in 19, the year 1990, that their focus suddenly switched from uh, no longer Douglas, they didn't consider Douglas a suspect anymore, it switched to a different man, which I don't know his name, I, was never, I couldn't find out what this man's name was, uh, but their focus switched to this man they had in custody for child molestation. Uh, they said that this man, this was the man, now all of a sudden this was the man who murdered Joshua, even though there was absolutely no physical evidence whatsoever to prove that this man had murdered uh, Josh White, but apparently they, that's with the GBI. They said that uh, Douglas is Douglas is not a suspect, but this man, he's the one who did it, but was never. There's no physical evidence. Never. This man was never tried, never even arrested for this for the murder at all. I don't even know what the reason what their reason for this was. I have no idea. Sharice <clears throat> also says through most of the uh, 90s, in the 1990s, she says the GBI refused to talk to her at all, period, until she demanded a meeting in 1997. Uh, in 1997, she met with um, an agent named uh, Robert Ingram, and when she confronted Ingram, uh, he had a very, uh, she says, indifferent attitude uh, towards the fact that the evidence in her son's case had been destroyed, and he uh, said it didn't matter because they, quote, had their man, end quote. So... I mean, if they, if they had their man, they never prosecuted their man. So, uh, Cherie also goes on to talk about um, the medical examiner's uh, conclusions about the murder scene. Uh, the Emmy apparently noted that Joshua had marks uh, on the backs of his legs. He says probably due to him being drugged across the ground into this uh, gully uh, in the woods back behind the apartment complex. And the thought is that he was murdered at or near his fort that I talked about. But the fort was so close to apparently this path that was the, uh, went through the woods uh, that the killer, after, after killing Joshua, drug Joshua's body uh, a few feet down into the gully in an effort to hide it. So, uh, she repraises the Emmy's uh, efforts. Uh, you know, she got along with him, she liked him, saying that he was very thorough, uh, very, quote, thorough and very involved, unquote. She says they have actually stayed in touch uh, and stayed in contact over the years. And this medical examiner, also don't know his name, uh, there was, it was really hard to find out information um, on, the, on the bones of this case. It was hard to find uh, anything. Uh, but this medical examiner, he allegedly felt <clears throat> the same frustration that Cherie had uh, felt with the GBI agents involved. Um, he says that the authorities had done their jobs correctly. He sees no reason why this case uh, shouldn't have been solved by now. So he also recalls how the female GBI agent refused to give him pertinent information he needed in order to conclude the autopsy or return any test results on labs that had been done uh, during Joshua's autopsy. So, and I know for a fact from, uh, you know, just over the years, uh, just reading and, 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 you know, learning about uh, this type of stuff. The medical examiner, it all depends, context, there's a lot of context 
you know, uh, the, the medical examiner needs to know this situation uh, or the circumstances surrounding um, this person's death so they can make an accurate, or so they can come up with an accurate conclusion to how this person died. They need all the facts. They need the facts from, from the, the law enforcement side and, you know, with the crime scene um, involved and, and just, they need everything. They need all of this information from all sides in order to be able to make their conclusion and, and because it, it does factor in, it factors in. So the fact that this GBI agent refused to do her part and uh, so they could, so the ME could do his part uh, is extremely like frustrating, frustrating on everybody's ends. You know, I can't even imagine. And I don't know why that you would think that a medical examiner would have enough pull or enough pull rank, you know, and demand some of the stuff. And maybe he, you know, like it's GBI, maybe he couldn't. <clears throat> I don't know. But um, in August of 1988, uh, which is the same year Joshua was murdered, the GBI, uh, also with the aid of the FBI, uh, the, the Behavioral um, Science Unit, uh, came up with a personality profile for the sus suspect. Now this was back in 1988, so you have to, uh, with this profile, you have to add 30 years onto um, this profile. They uh, concluded that it's a... Uh, the killer is a white male between 25 and 35 years of age, this was back in 1988, has average to above average intelligence and likely lived near the scene of the crime. Uh, the killer is probably married to his second or third wife, is in a strained relationship, and is possibly experiencing financial problems. They also say those close to the killer would describe him as being explosive, who have confronted about his withdrawn behavior would become argumentative and defensive. Uh, the profile also seems to indicate that the man had a reason for murdering Joshua, an eight-year-old, and wasn't the type of person that would fit the profile of a serial offender. So, I don't know. Um, I don't know what, why anyone would have a reason to murder an eight-year-old. Um, you know, and that this was, like I said, 30 years ago. I'm pretty sure that um, there are methods for profiling have probably changed somewhat so uh, that if asked today that would probably um, change the profile that they had in 1988 but we don't know because they don't comment on this case they won't uh, don't say anything they won't even admit that they they won't admit that they lost the evidence to this case or that they got rid of it destroyed it whatever they did they won't admit that they won't they're really not trying at all to solve this uh, poor kid's murder. Um, Cherie had nothing bad actually to say about the Roswell Police Department. It was all about she, it was all about the GBI messing up. But she had she had nothing bad to say about the Roswell a Police Department saying they were still uh, actively working with her to solve her son's murder. And I'm going to give you this female GBI agent's name. I was able to find her name is Lisa Harris. Is the female GBI agent that was in charge of Joshua's murder. I don't know if she still is. I hope not, but uh, Lisa Harris, so uh, poo on you, you did a crappy job, you're doing a crappy job. Uh, at the time, back then, there was a reward offered in the amount of $7,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for Joshua's murder. <clears throat> the then governor of Georgia, uh, Joe Frank Harris, actually contributed $2,000 of those dollars, uh, the other $5,000 came from private donors within the community. Um, and after Joshua's death, um, Cherie and Douglas actually, obviously, moved out of that apartment where he had been murdered and um, moved into a house in Woodstock because they, they couldn't be in the apartment. I mean, could you? I mean, I couldn't stay there, so they, they left. Uh, they eventually, <clears throat> sadly though, they eventually divorced, uh, but um, continued to remain uh, very close friends. And, uh, unfortunately, this is sad news, unfortunately, Cherie Harmon actually uh, passed away. She passed away a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. So, it's, to me, it's so sad. So sad. She passed away, actually, on October 15th, so less than a month ago, or almost a month ago, uh, from stage 4 cancer, and she was only 65 years old, and she was, uh, as you'll see in the footage, she's uh, buried 
next to her son at the cemetery. So, you know, she died. She died before seeing justice for her son's murder, which is just horribly tragic. Okay, I'm back in the woods behind uh, River Crossing at Roswell. And actually, I'm up here right now, and this is a pretty busy road, it looks like. Well, fairly busy. But this is one edge of the woods, and there's uh, businesses. I'm not sure what that is over there. Um, I'm not sure. If it's a grocery store or a warehouse or a department store, I'm not sure. Uh, there's more buildings over there. I think that's another apartment complex. But if you go and look down at this hill, I mean, this... This is the woods back behind the apartment complex, and it's pretty extensive. I'm not sure where his fort was. I have no idea. Obviously, it's not here anymore. 30 years later, 32 years later. So, but we uh, know that he was drugged down into a gully, which looks like is what is down in here. So we're gonna go check this out see what all I and mean, these woods are pretty cool I can see how a young boy would love to spend time out here exploring and uh, playing you know I see there's some trails you know probably not purposefully done trails but I mean, this is I guess you could call it a gully a creek or something I, I mean I don't see any water Okay, there's a lot of trash down here. That's where I keep hearing people. There's a lot of stuff. There's like a chair right there. It's weird. Creepy. A little creepy. Well, things are a lot different now than they were back then. There weren't nearly as many homeless people and uh, vagrants. I, I don't think. Anyways. So I don't know. I don't know if this is uh, where he was found. It was in this gully right here. There's chairs down here. So weird. Uh, you know, we have... I mean, I don't know where a good place... I mean, there's lots of spots, I guess, where his fort could have been. A lot of interesting places. More woods. I'm not going to... Actually, I'm not going to climb up in there. Uh, lots of interesting places a little boy could um, have a fort. I don't know what he made this fort out of. If it was woods or, or logs, tree branches probably. I don't know what else he would have. Uh, there's a lot of rocks, like a lot of big rocks. And uh, pipes and metal and homeless people encampments. I wonder if they even know these people are back here. Oh, there's a deer. Saw a deer. Look, see it? Running? There it is. I see it. This ground is really soft. See it? Where'd it go? There it goes. There's a deer. Where'd he go? It's over in here. I'm gonna go look over in here. Wow, I can't believe there's deer living back in here, actually. It's pretty crazy. I mean, this is pretty neat. I mean, look at these, these rocks up here. Another deer. There's deer everywhere. Holy shit. Where'd you go, buddy? There's deer everywhere back here, man. Where'd he go? Look at this, it's like a concave, uh, I'm not sure what that is. These, yeah, plenty of fun places to have a fort, definitely. big these woods are, man. Jeez. 
pretty, pretty extensive. A lot of fallen trees out here. A lot of fallen trees. I seriously, if this patch of woods is surrounded on all sides by busy roads and buildings, I can't believe deer live here. I mean, although it does go pretty far back. Uh, and I'm actually, I've already run across two, um, two homeless uh, camps. Uh, actually, one of them, some dude was sleeping underneath a tarp. Um, I don't know. If, I don't think I caught that on video. There's traffic's getting louder. So it must be it must be where 400 is. It's over that way. The one of the highways, main highways in Atlanta. You can hear it from here. But there's, yeah, I mean, there is obviously very easy to hide back in here. Like I said, I've already come, uh, seen two or three homeless people camping out. Uh, I'm trying not to get too close because, you know, you never know how aggressive uh, people might get with you. It's a... You know, it's weird. Just because it feels open, you know, he was killed in May. So May is a lot. Obviously, this is fall. So there's a camp right there. I don't see any people. I don't know what that is. Um, May, there's a lot of uh, greenery, a lot more shrubbery. Uh, right now, it's fall. So there's, uh, it just seems really open, but yet at the same time, really secluded. It's hard to explain, but in May, there definitely would have been easy for someone to get away, kill somebody and get away. I wish I could find, what the fuck is all this? This is a lot of electrical equipment, toolboxes. Uh, that's a tent, from what I can tell, it used to be a tent, pots and pans. sleeping bag. Someone used to have their camp here, but it is, there's a suitcase. It has um, gone under another tent. It has gone underneath the, is that a sweatshirt in the tree? Okay, basketball. D'Angelo. D'Angelo. That's weird. Suitcase. Got a stuffed animal? That's not cool. Makes you wonder. Yeah. More, there's like stuff everywhere. Really kind of creepy, actually. I hope I don't get murdered. It's kind of creepy. I mean, the goalie's down, whew, down that way. So, like I said, I don't see any set paths, like, like it said how there was when Joshua uh, died. It said there was a path, a set path going by his fort. I don't see anything like that. I see, like, small paths where you can tell people have walked on it, but not, not a clear-cut path. So, I'm not, I don't know where this, where this would have been. But look at, I mean, look at all these fallen trees. There's so much that you could use to make a fort. House, even. With the skill. Shopping cart. There's a shopping cart out in the middle of the woods in a fire extinguisher. At least there's no spider webs yet that I've ran into. More deer. There they go. Loud as hell. Where'd they go? I still can't believe there's crazy deer here. Okay, let's, um, I don't know the best way to go here. Ah! Ooh, that's a hole. Okay. Ah! What the fuck? 
I did not know, I did not come prepared in proper gear, hiking shoes to be tromping through the woods. I'm telling you. Okay. Such a big piece of land. I mean, I can't even see the, well, I see the road. That's 400, I think. You see the cars. Maybe a little bit. Maybe it's not 400. I don't know. Let's see. I mean, there's an obvious way out. There's, and there's buildings. That's part of the apartment complex. I mean, yeah, this is a big, big patch of land. Yeah, that is 400. You can see the, I don't know, you can see the cars. That is 400, right there, yep. I don't know, I don't know what's down that way. I mean, now that I'm back here, you know, I was kind of criticizing uh, the fact that the police department, that lieutenant, what is this down here? That lieutenant had stumbled across Joshua's body in uh, some brush covered with pine straw. Um, and I was kind of criticizing it, but now uh -huh, I can see, I can understand now that I'm back here, I can understand how that uh, is possible because this place there's so many fallen trees and brush and just, I mean, so much that uh, it would be hard to look in every nook and cranny. I mean, this is a, a gully. Maybe this fort was by, over here somewhere. Cause this is definitely a gully. Some kind of weird drainage ditch over here. parking lot and the there's the pool over there pool and then there's a the playground over here I want to see what this right here was there's a lot of maybe a deer shelter I mean, there are lots of deer okay okay now we're getting back See, here's the road to get out. Oh, geese. Lots of geese. Lots of wood chips. And then them cutting lumber. See the geese? Geese are evil. Ah! Oh, that was deep. Because there's a lake. There's that lake that the divers looked for Joshua in this lake. I have no food. I have no food for you. I have no food. Do you see how not scared they are? I have no food for you. Don't hiss at me. Don't give me the hairy eyeball. I have no food for you. No food. Get out of here. Shoot. What the? What are you? Are you a turkey? Are you a turkey or a goose? What are you? Huh? What exactly are you? A duck? A giant duck? I don't know, buddy. It has webbed feet. Mm. Let's see, here's the playground. Uh, I'm pretty sure this was the playground was here. What up, homie? Playground. Yeah, lots of woods back in there. Okay, I'm actually um, out of the woods now. Um, 
and I came to find uh, Joshua's apartment where him and his mother and his stepfather lived. Climbed up this little hill. There's this road. Uh, and there's 400. You can hear it. Um, but this is his apartment building. And he actually lived... Uh, he lived in apartment 1456B, which is where those where those kids are walking into. Yeah, 1456B, that's where he lived. Uh, right there. So, you know, uh, over on the other side, uh, you can't really see it from here, but there is a lake. A pretty decent sized lake, very pretty. Has a fountain, just like the cemetery did. Uh, that's the lake the divers uh, searched uh, looking for Joshua's body. You know, and the on the other side of there is the woods where Joshua would go play all the time. I wasn't able to really definitively decide or see where his fort was. So many places, possible places where it could have been. I just don't. I don't know. It's it's the woods are so big. I mean, there's no way I could have discerned where his fort was. Very big. Um, very cool place to play. Uh, easy to hide. Um, you know, I don't know. This is where he lived. There actually seems to be kids living there now. I wonder if they probably don't know. I'm not going to ruin their day by telling them. So, all right. Well, that's it for locations. Bye. Okay, here we are at Greenlawn, Greenlawn Cemetery in Roswell, uh, Georgia. And after some searching, we was able to find Joshua's grave. Here's his grave. He's got some flowers. Born August 14th, 1979. Passed away May 15th, 1988. And actually, here is his mother's grave, Cherie Harmon. She passed away a couple weeks ago. Uh, they don't have a gravestone for her yet. So we actually got some, got a potted poinsettia that Bella is going to put at the top of her grave right here, because it's almost Christmas. So we're gonna put that there in, in lieu of a gravestone. Okay, here's the pond. So he's on, he's on this little hill overlooking this pond. There's a ton of geese out here. And we actually noticed that he actually, he has a bench as well. Joshua Randall Harmon. He has his own bench. It says his light will always shine, which is so sweet. So yeah, and his great his, him and his mom's graves are right there on the hillside with the fountain. Geese. A, a one, one small ray of, of light uh, after she, uh, you know, obviously before she passed away. But after her divorce from Douglas, um, her and Larry Harmon, who was uh, Joshua's biological father, actually uh, got back together and they remarried. And they were still together when uh, um, they were still together at the time of her passing. So, you know, uh, she, I recall reading that she had said about uh, them being back together that uh, they saw in each other, they saw their son, you know. So that actually uh, helped them to maybe get, just cope with it and get through it, you know. Um, I don't know. But, but both, um, He's still alive, though. Larry Harmon. Both Joshua and Cherie are survived by Larry Harmon. Uh, Cherie's mother, uh, Maxine, is also still uh, with us. She has a sister, Marlene, and a brother, Steve, and they're also they're still here. And they all live uh, locally, like Woodstock, uh, Alpharetta, uh, which is all Georgia, obviously. All very close. Um, yeah, but it's just, it's, it's extremely sad. I mean... You know, there's the GBI was has been so 
uh, focused on these sus certain suspects that never went anywhere. They have no proof. They have no uh, physical evidence to tie Douglas, the step stepfather, and then later on this other child molester, you know, the fugitive, and then uh, I don't understand why 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 they focused on these um, these these men when to me uh, it's obvious that for instance Douglas it's obvious to me that the stepfather didn't have anything to do with this so I don't understand why how, what made them focus so so much actually my question is and here's my here's my thing which I found interesting what about this man that was lived in the next building in the beginning remember when I said talked about uh, the man that Joshua had apparently encountered twice twice on the day that he uh, was murdered and went, went missing and was murdered the man who gave him the three yellow roses for his mother and then the man who said he had a tiger's eye rock worth a hundred million dollars what about that man to me he that man stands out very very huge in my mind I mean that that was my immediate thought when I when I read that I was like you know has any does anyone know who this man is is have they questioned this man because to me, that's, uh, I'm sorry, but that's odd. That is odd that this, like, where did this man live? Was he just hanging out outside and, like, or was he literally, like, watching Joshua? And then um, when he noticed Joshua went out in the woods, that he followed him and killed him? Like, come on. Like, what? I mean, but the nothing. The only, the only way I heard about this man was from Cherie herself. So nothing from the GBI, nothing from law enforcement. <clears throat> like, do they know about this dude? Did they question? How, who did they question in the apartment complex? You know, like I would think this man in this building, in this next building, would be is a likely, most likely suspect. Honestly, like, and I don't understand why and nothing's been done about uh, that. So um, I would, I would think, I would point at him as the most likely suspect. Honestly, I just think it's, it's just weird. It's just weird his interactions with Joshua. It really is. I think it is. So that's just my opinion. I don't know. Um, hopefully, there's hopefully there's more information that I just uh, can't get a hold of because they're not uh, giving that information out to the public. I seriously hope that they ha have more than what I think they do because it's this little boy's murder. It needs to be solved. Come on. I mean, his mother passed away without ever getting justice. There's no reason. If you know anything. <clears throat> if you know anybody who knows anything, please contact the GBI by calling uh, this tip line at 1-800-597-8477. Or you can go online and be anonymous <clears throat> at gbi.georgia.gov. And I want to, want to apologize. My throat, my throat, I think I'm starting to lose my voice for some reason. So, or getting a cold of some kind. So I apologize. <clears throat> I feel like I sound scratchy. <laughs> um, we're about to, we're about to uh, wrap wrap this up actually the next video I want to talk about that I'm gonna do and I decided to, uh, to do this uh, next video actually on a more lighthearted note because the past couple of cases that I've done have been um, emotionally uh, draining for me and uh, just I don't I don't know I feel like I need to uh, do something more lighthearted so I'm actually gonna do um, in the, and I'm going to do outside of Georgia. Uh, I'm not going to go on location though, but it's going to be, I'm going to do a video on uh, the craziest and the silliest and the stupidest um, deaths, not murders, but deaths, deaths in the country um, over the years. So, and uh, hopefully have a little laugh at uh, some of these um, silly, silly deaths. So I'm going to do that. And, uh, you know, just to give a, give me, I guess a little break. A little break from all this uh, morbid, heart-wrenching murder. So, um, and I want to thank you for watching my videos. Um, please stick in there with me. Once again, my name is Jen Marie. Thank you for watching my channel, Crime Rewind. And I'll catch you on the flip side.